Welcome to this lecture entitled The Work of Grace in the Life of Charles Doe. It's the final lecture in this year's series entitled Ordinary People, Extraordinary God. In the first lecture, we heard about Susanna Bell, an ordinary merchant's wife and mother who emigrated with her family to New uh, England in order to be free to worship according to their consciences. On their return to England, God brought them safely through civil war, plague and fire. Our second lecture focused on William Oakley, a very ordinary young man whose life was turned upside down by being captured by Islamic pirates and taken into slavery in Algiers. Oakley attributed his miraculous escape from this situation to the providential grace of God. And now we come to the third in our trio of ordinary people, Charles Doe. He was a generation younger than the other two, which moves our study forward in time, when a different set of challenges faced the people of God. It's the time when nonconformists became more commonly called dissenters. And our focus will be on the events that occurred after 1660, when the monarchy and the person of King Charles II was restored. This followed the civil war of the 1640s, the execution of King Charles I and the era of Oliver Cromwell's Commonwealth and Protectorate in the late 1640s and 1650s. During this period, Cromwell championed increasing religious toleration and as a result, a proliferation of different nonconformist groups and churches flourished. Presbyterians, Congregationalists or Independents, Baptists and more fringe sects like the Quakers, Seekers, Ranters and Fifth Monarchy Men. And it was said that religion was the topic of debate in every tavern and alehouse. This was the background to Charles Doe's birth around 1651. In many ways, he was the most ordinary of our subjects in that he never left England and in fact lived in the same area, London, all of his life. He was a skilled tradesman, but we know few details of his life. Most of what we do know comes from a collection of testimonies, including his own, which he published in 1700, when he was nearly 50, but was written over a decade earlier. This book was entitled A Collection of Experiences of the Work of Grace or the Spirit of God Working Upon the Souls of Several Persons, Whereby It Is Demonstrated Their Conversion to Christ or Signs of Being in the Peculiar Love of God to Salvation. And such accounts of God's working in your life were commonly required when a person applied to join a gathered church, as Susanna Bell discovered. So individuals were encouraged to trace their own spiritual journey to faith and look for evidences or signs of God's providential dealings with them. And we shall also find that Charles Doe was ordinary in the sense that he was not necessarily a model Christian who could be held up for others to imitate. He didn't get everything right. He had his own particular faults and idiosyncrasies, as we shall see, which others may have found irritating. He spent much time wrestling with biblical truths, especially that complex relationship between God's sovereignty and human responsibility. Sometimes he expended a lot of mental effort on minor issues of doctrine or practice. He found it hard to take a stand for what he believed. Charles, in fact, wrote a piece called The Struggler, describing somebody else, but which also seems a fitting epithet for his own life. However, there's no doubt that Charles was a true believer in Jesus Christ, and his sheer ordinariness and weak humanity makes it easier for us, for me certainly, to identify with him in his struggles. The lecture will take the following form. Section one, Charles's early life from 1652 to 1667. Two, his apprenticeship 
from 1667 to 1674. Three, setting up in business and baptism. That's from 1674 to 1685. Section four, the persecuting time, from the 1660s uh, to 1685. Section five covers his assurance. Six, a new venture, and section seven or conclusion will be nine lessons from the life of Charles Doe. So then section one, Charles's early life, 1652, to 1667. Frustratingly for us, Doe begins his account of his experiences by saying that, for brevity's sake, he will omit details of his parentage and birth. However, although it's impossible to be sure, it seems likely that Charles was born in London around 1651 to 2. There's a record of a Charles Doe being baptised in St Olave's Parish Church on the banks of the Thames in Southwark in 1651. And this was an area south of the River Thames where we know that Charles lived for much of his life. In the 1650s, when Charles was a young boy, St Olave's benefited from a fine Puritan ministry in the form of its pastor, William Cooper, and the celebrated lecturer, Ralph Fenning. The only thing that Charles tells us about his parents is that his father served as a soldier, a captain in Oliver Cromwell's new model army that was responsible for the dissolving of the Long Parliament in 1648. So obviously Charles's father was parliamentary in his sympathies, though he says nothing about his religious views. And Charles says that, looking back, he can see God's restraining and preserving grace throughout his childhood years, including several instances when he nearly drowned. But Charles gives few details, quotes, partly because I have forgot what religious impressions they made upon me. And in an age that looked for evidences, a less honest person than Charles might have been tempted to make something up, or at least exaggerate. But Charles says that as a child, he was soberly disposed and seldom or never took delight in mischief or rudeness, but was for things fair and honest. So, a serious introverted boy with a sense of natural justice. And he also declares that in matters of religion, he was... Quote, always addicted to put questions for the finding out of the truth, being jealous or afraid of being cheated by men's ignorance or designs. He must have driven his parents and teachers mad. And this characteristic of questioning everything, even the most abstruse or ridiculous things, persisted throughout his life. It was a good thing never to take things on someone else's say-so, but perhaps he overdid it. He seemed to realise this failing in himself when, towards the end of his narrative, he calls himself Silly Me. Now, section two, Apprenticeship, 1667 to 1674. When Charles was 15 years old in 1667, he became a London apprentice. Every year, over a thousand youths arrived in London from all over England, set on the same course. Charles's family would have seen this as a way for their son to make his way in the world and laid out a sum of money to enable his training. His father would have paid a fee and signed indentures for Charles to serve as an apprentice for seven years with a master craftsman a member of one of the London companies, after which, if he completed his apprenticeship satisfactorily, Charles would be able, when he reached the age of 24 or thereabouts, to practice as a qualified member of that company and even become a freeman or citizen of the City of London. During those seven years as an apprentice, Charles would have lived in the household of his master, 
dependent on him for bed and board. He would receive no wages. And he would have become integrated in that household with the family, the servants, perhaps another apprentice and journeyman. And the trade to which Charles Doe was apprenticed was comb making. Now comb making was an ancient art practiced by the Egyptians and the Romans. But in England, the Comb Makers Company only received its royal patent in 1635. Combs came in various forms and for a variety of purposes, for grooming horses in the textile making process or for domestic human usage. Making combs was a highly skilled process performed with specialist tools and Charles would have had a lot to learn. Combs could be made from metal, wood, bone or ivory, either elaborately decorative or very simple for everyday use, including the removal of lice. They were often given as favours or love tokens. Samuel Pepys, a contemporary of Doe, records in his diary the purchase of two inexpensive wooden combs, which could be bought for a penny for his wife to give to their servants. Apprentices formed a large element in London society. A group of upwards of 8,000 young men living away from home and with the potential for causing trouble if they ever banded together, which had happened on a couple of notable occasions in the past. Consequently, regulations forbade apprentices from gambling, marrying, staying out late to haunt playhouses or taverns without permission. But apprenticeship was also a period when many young men, idealistic and radical, began to discuss and think about religious matters. Many had been eager supporters of the Reformation in the previous century, and several apprentices wrote to Richard Baxter for spiritual advice in the late 1650s. And it was indeed the time when Charles started to think seriously about spiritual things too. He took the opportunity to frequent services of the Presbyterians and also what he calls the General Redemption Baptists. With his questioning nature, I'm sure he wanted to find out what each was teaching. In Southwark at this time, there was a large congregation of Presbyterians meeting at St Thomas's under the ministry of Nathaniel Vincent, an eminent preacher ejected from the Church of England in 1662. As for the Baptists, there were two distinct kinds by this stage. The particular or Calvinistic Baptists, who believed that Christ died to save his particular or elect people, and the group with which Charles began to associate, the General or Arminian Baptists who held that Christ's death made salvation possible for all people who could choose by an act of their own free will whether or not to accept it. Charles's father was unhappy about him trying these different churches and commanded him to stop going. But Charles countered his father's arguments by saying that he only wanted what his father had fought for, liberty of conscience. His father had no reply to this and never afterwards tried to make Charles go anywhere against his conscience. And Charles tells two stories relating to this period that show his unsettled state of mind but also his desire for salvation. The first was a recurring temptation whenever he saw a candle burning down to think that if he didn't manage to finish whatever task he was doing at the time or get into bed before the candle died out, this was a sign or omen that he would fall short of getting into heaven or be saved. The second story, occurring near the end of his apprenticeship in 1674, also involved a candle. Charles was travelling out of London, a pack of combs on his back, to sell his master's wares at the fair in Saffron Walden. It began to get dark. Charles was very tired after walking such a distance, but he didn't know how far he would have to go 
to find a lodging. Alone and exhausted, Charles felt he had no choice but to spend the night under a hedge. In his despair, words came into his mind. Hold out to the end and thou shalt be saved. And this encouraged him to continue walking. And soon he spied a lighted candle shining across a field, indicating the presence of a house. Here he found refreshment and a bed for the night. At the time, he felt that by this experience, God was warning him not to be careless in searching for the way to heaven. But in later years, he interpreted it as a sign of God's special love and providential care to him. Section three, setting up in business and baptism. Once Charles had completed his apprenticeship, he opened a shop and began to practice his trade as a comb maker. And it's how he usually signed himself, Charles Doe, comb maker. His shop was in the borough, Southwark, an ancient bustling settlement on the southern bank of the River Thames, the gateway to the city of London from the south. And everyone who wanted to enter London would travel for half a mile along Southwark's main thoroughfare, the borough or high street, as it continued onto Old London Bridge, the only crossing point of the river at this time. The borough was lined on both sides by businesses and shops of all sorts, as well as coaching inns, over 20 at this time, catering to the needs of the numerous travellers. Above the shop frontages and taverns was living accommodation, and behind were yards with workshops, stables and tenements. This is the yard behind Charles Doe's shop. His shop, which later became a confectioner's, could be found at the sign of the Boar's Head, located near the top of the borough, between St Thomas's Hospital and London Bridge. And it was from the Tabard Inn on the borough that Chaucer's pilgrims set out on their journey to Canterbury 200 years earlier. And in 1836, Dickens refers in the Pickwick Papers to the ancient coaching inns still remaining on the street. Quotes, great, rambling, queer old places they were, with galleries and passages. Sadly, much of Old Southwark was swept away in the Great Fire of Southwark in 1676 and in later modernisations. And from these coaching inns, there were regular coach or carriage services to many places in the south of England. But if you wanted to travel to Leicester in 1684, you would have to cross the river where on Mondays a service left from the rows in West Smithfield. But Southwark was also a shady area with a disreputable reputation in some quarters. As well as being the site of Shakespeare's Globe Theatre, it also housed the Bear Garden where bear baitings were held and five prisons, including the infamous Marshalsea. It had been the location of the notorious stews or brothels along the riverbank, now officially closed, but prostitution still continued unabated. And Southwark was the place where young male Londoners would head for a rowdy and drunken night out. This is where Charles Doe worked and lived. It was also a place where many wooden dissenting meeting houses existed in the crowded, narrow yards and alleys off the main streets. Well, Charles's spiritual struggles continued for a couple of years. In his private apartment above the shop, he would pray diligently, but really wondered if he was any the better for all his praying. But he resisted the temptation to stop praying by reflecting I didn't know a better way to be saved than by praying, and therefore I must keep on, though I do not see it comes to anything as yet. The devil was very real to Charles at this time, appearing to him one night in a horrible dream. But amazingly, Charles wasn't afraid, and relying on God, told the devil 
You can do me no hurt except God give you leave. And what he gives you leave to do, I am willing to submit to. The devil departed without a word and Charles slept undisturbed for the rest of the night. In the morning, he concluded that it must be the effect of God's grace in his life which enabled him to cope with this dream so calmly. And it seems that God was working in Charles's life, although he was still far from having any assurance that he was saved. On another business journey to a fair in Cambridge, Charles passed the spot where he previously received comfort and guidance from the Lord. And this set him, set him thinking again. He felt that he had been religiously disposed, as he put it, for quite a long time now, but had made no open profession of his faith. Shouldn't he be baptised, which would show that he was freely choosing to follow Christ and be a plain sign to others? He'd been attending a Baptist church and was already convinced of the scriptural command for believers to be baptised. Baptism might bring the assurance that he lacked. What was there to hinder him? And coming to a stop in the middle of the road, he continued to reason with himself. He enjoyed his present freedom, but if he became an open professor of the gospel, he would have to be very careful about everything he did and he felt deeply his own inability to live a holy life. On the other hand, if he delayed being baptised until he was good enough, he would probably never be baptised at all. On this, Charles resolved to be baptised when he returned to London, endeavouring to live as well as he could, if not as well as he would. Thus, a month after he got back to London, Charles went to see Thomas Plant, minister since 1678 of Paul's Alley General Baptist Church in the Barbican in the centre of London, a large, well-known congregation formed in the time of the Civil War. Charles was hesitant about approaching such a popular preacher, but Thomas Plant received him kindly. Charles expected some searching theological questions, but Mr Plant simply asked him why he wished to be baptised. And Charles gave the response of Philip to the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8. If thou believest, thou mayest be baptised. And, said Thomas Plant, looking closely at him, do you believe? Charles was taken aback, lost for words, eventually stammering, I think I do, I reckon I do, if I know my own heart, I do believe. Wisely, seeing Charles's confusion, Thomas Plant did not press him about what he believed, but merely said he would make inquiries about Charles's life and conduct and give him an answer regarding baptism the following week. And looking back on this interview in later years, Charles concluded that he truly did believe and had the root of the matter in him, but that he had less knowledge of Christ or how to express his faith than he gained afterwards. However, as he was walking home after the interview, Charles was turning things over in his mind. What if no one spoke well of him, or indeed spoke ignorantly or maliciously in response to Mr Plant's inquiries. Would he be beholden to someone else's opinion to get him into heaven? Charles decided that this was no way to proceed on someone else's say-so. and When he got home, he wrote a long and offended letter to Mr Plant. Subsequently, Charles became preoccupied with the manner of baptism, believing that if he wasn't baptised in the correct way, then it would not be a valid baptism. And you may remember from an earlier lecture that John Smythe had got caught up in controversial debates about the same thing in the early 17th century. And the early English Baptists had practiced sprinkling and it wasn't until the 1640s that baptism by immersion or dipping as they called it began to become the regular method 
Finally, Charles concluded that he couldn't find a better way than dipping. But he also realised that all the time he'd spent thinking about what was essentially a secondary matter was Satan's method of keeping him from actually being baptised. When Charles saw this, he says, he was baptised straight away. This was in the year 1682, and he was about 30 years old. He doesn't say where he was baptised, but as he continued to be associated with Thomas Plant's General Baptists in Paul's Alley, it was most likely at that church. But no sooner than Charles had been baptised, changed out of his wet clothes and sat back down in the meeting, the devil began to taunt him. Well, you've been baptised. Are you any better now? All Charles could reply was that even if he wasn't any more worthy or holy, he was satisfied that he had been obedient. But Charles also began to face renewed temptation to keep his faith private. And this was a particularly strong temptation at a time when nonconformists were being singled out for persecution, as we'll hear more in a few moments. Charles reasoned with himself that what he believed was an internal matter of the heart, so only told those closest to him and generally kept quiet. But his conscience was telling him that he had made a solemn profession. He had put his hand to God's plough and should not look back. He wanted to please and serve God, but how could he be sure what God's will for his life was? And as usual, Charles spent a lot of time thinking about this and about his own weakness and also listening to people who held different opinions. And the result was that he only succeeded in tying himself in knots and feeling at his wits end. And he likened himself to Christian in John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, who went to Mount Sinai, symbolising law and works, in the vain hope of being eased of his burden. And Pilgrim's Progress had been published for the first time a few years earlier, in 1678, and it soon became a bestseller. And sometimes it's difficult for a person to pinpoint the exact date of their conversion, especially when they've been brought up in a Christian home. It may not always be an instantaneous event. And Charles obviously struggled with this issue. And he shares his experiences in some detail, he says, so that it might help others who mistakenly conclude that their lack of clear spiritual understanding in their earlier days must mean that they were not regenerate at that time. As Charles points out, Christians are not born fully grown or mature. All start as babes in Christ, needing to grow in knowledge and grace. And even the weak and confused cries of the newborn infant, he says, are a proof that they are alive, not stillborn. And all this time, as Charles pursued his relentless quest for truth, he faithfully attended the preaching of Thomas Plant and breaking of bread. He'd listened to the preaching of General Redemption Baptists for many years now, and in debates with others and himself, he continued to defend this position against God's election of a particular people to salvation. And although Charles thought that he had a strong case, he began almost to envy those who believed that they were elected by God's sovereign power, because they would be able to rest in the assurance that there was nothing more for them to accomplish. But Charles wasn't yet ready to accept that the doctrine of election was scriptural. He worried that if he didn't believe that heaven's gate was open to all men, he might find himself excluded. For when there is room for all to enter, he said, then there will be room for me. And he was still looking for evidence of his salvation through his own good works and could not assure himself of God's peculiar or electing love to him. 
Now section four, the persecuting time, 1660 to 1689. Charles says that he continues in the same fashion until, quotes, the persecution began to be hot at the latter end of King Charles II's reign in 1684, 1685. In fact, persecution of dissenters had been going on for 25 years by this time, but it intensified in these years. And to understand what Charles and his fellow nonconformists were going through, we'll have a brief overview of the historical context. And if you want to know more detail, I can recommend a little book by Lee Gatiss, The Tragedy of 1662, available from the Latimer Trust. The whole of the 30 year period from 1660, the restoration of the monarchy, to 1689, the glorious revolution, the start of William and Mary's reign, is really a story of nonconformist persecution with short interludes of toleration. This persecution was led at different times by King Charles II, by Parliament and the Church of England hierarchy, motivated by revenge, fear and a desire to create uniformity in religion. Charles II, who above all wanted to keep his throne and his head, and like his father, was a worldly cynical man with Roman Catholic sympathies. But in 1660, his reign began hopefully for dissenters when Charles II issued a declaration promising liberty to tender consciences. Some welcomed this as sincere, but others were suspicious that the king's intentions were motivated more by his concern for Roman Catholics than for dissenters. And the 1660s saw a whole raft of legislation designed to suppress all who would not conform to the Church of England. Existing legislation allowing toleration was repealed and previous penal laws were reenacted. Anyone who wished to hold local public office was required to attend and take communion in their local parish of the Church of England. The Conventicle Act forbade five or more people meeting together for worship except in accordance with the Church of England liturgy. In 1662, the Act of Uniformity led to about 1,800 Puritan ministers being thrown out of the established church in what is called the Great Ejection, and then prohibited from preaching anywhere within five miles of their previous parish. And heavy fines, imprisonment and transportation were the usual penalties for disobeying these laws. In some areas, local magistrates were lenient in enforcing the legislation, but in other places, the treatment of dissenters was brutal and vindictive. They were dragged from their beds in the middle of the night, whipped and kicked, driven many miles on foot. Meetings were forcibly broken up, books burnt and goods seized to pay the ruinous fines. And informers who infiltrated meetings and reported people to magistrates were handsomely rewarded. It was at this time, 1660, that John Bunyan was arrested while preaching in the open air and thrown into Bedford jail. His imprisonment was relatively lenient, but many dissenters died in foul prison conditions. As one historian has put it, the restoration witnessed a persecution of Protestants by Protestants without parallel in 17th century Europe. Most dissenters stood firm in these tribulations, knowing that they must expect to suffer for the Lord Jesus, and membership grew in many congregations. But dissenters were faced with a dilemma. To what extent was it right to attempt to comply with official prohibitions, or should they refuse to obey and suffer the consequences? Quakers were the most resolute and thus suffered the harshest treatment. In 
Some dissenters thought it was acceptable to attend parish churches and even take communion, thus offering a partial or occasional conformity, in addition to attending their own private meetings. Some tried to comply by meeting in groups of four, with the minister going around and preaching the same sermon five or more times each Sunday. But others felt that they had to take an open stand. A general Baptist church in Kent excluded from membership one who advocated, quotes, making our knees feeble by creeping into corners and meeting by falls. And at the height of their ninth and severest persecution, the pastor of Broadmead Particular Baptist Church in Bristol wrote from prison, where he later died, urging his congregation to continue to meet publicly until they were made to cease by force. Others held services at times and places where they might elude discovery. At two o'clock in the morning, or in a concealed room above the ceiling of their meeting house. Ministers were liable to the severest penalties, so the congregation sought to protect them by posting youths at the door to warn of approaching officers, or to have women sitting on the stairs to block their entry. Members might sing a psalm to cover the escape of their pastor from the building, and to hide his identity a minister might preach behind a curtain or surrounded by tall men with a trap door beneath his feet. There was a brief respite from persecution in the year 1672 when the king issued a declaration of indulgence, allowing all dissenters, including Catholics, to meet freely for worship, provided that they had a license for their meeting place and their preacher. This measure was met with mixed feelings. Dissenters were uneasy that the king was ruling by direct royal pronouncement, bypassing parliament and the law, not a good precedent. Some felt that toleration could not be given by a civil power. The church and state were separate and the church was outside civil jurisdiction. They also feared that by supplying information to the authorities to get a licence, this might one day be used against them, as has been the case in totalitarian states in more recent times. And dissenters were right to be wary. Gilbert Sheldon, Archbishop of Canterbury, wrote a letter in 1676 saying that, quotes, the just number of dissenters being known, their suppression will be a work very practicable. However, 1,610 licences were issued to Presbyterian, Congregationalist and Baptist preachers, and nearly 500 imprisoned dissenters, including John Bunyan, received a royal pardon. But from the mid-1670s, there was increasing concern about the growing influence of James, Duke of York, the king's brother, a Roman Catholic, and heir to the throne. Alarms around the Popish plot of 1678 led to demands that James be excluded from the succession. Charles II would have none of this. And now that he was receiving French subsidies for his secret promises to convert to Roman Catholicism and aid English Catholics, he could afford to do without Parliament. The dissenters were left to suffer the full force of royal vengeance. And this period of persecution from 1681 to the end of his reign, 1685, was the most severe of the Restoration period. In London, one historian has calculated, over 3,800 different people were arrested and brought before the courts between 1682 and 1686 for attending non-conformist conventicles. London dissent was terrorised by the Hilton Gang, a band of over 40 thuggish informers who infiltrated meetings, gathering incriminating information, 
participated in prosecutions and seized dissenters' goods by force when they failed to pay their fines. And there were many frustrated dissenters in the ranks of the Duke of Monmouth's army during his ill-fated rebellion of 1685, which was so harshly repressed. So how did all this affect Charles Doe? He was only eight in 1660, so the earliest um, persecution may have passed him by. Though he might have seen the head of the Fifth Monarchy Men's rebel leader displayed on London Bridge in 1661, later Charles was attending Thomas Plant's church in the Barbican. At the time its meetings were being disturbed and the pulpit and benches being smashed to pieces on the orders of the Earl of Bridgewater. And this may have caused his reluctance to declare his faith openly. But Thomas Plant was so popular in the area that even when nine warrants were sent out for his arrest, the constables gave him advance warning privately so that he could escape before they arrived to serve them. However, to avoid arrest, Plant was forced to go in various disguises as he walked the streets. They were so good that even some of his own flock didn't recognise him when they met him. And by the time that things began to really hot up around 1684, Charles was a tradesman with a business to run. And he began to wrestle with his conscience as he had after his baptism. He sat in his room and he wrote down both sides of the argument. Wasn't he at liberty to attend the parish church, and thus offering an outward conformity, rather than having to suffer the loss of his goods that he'd worked so hard to earn? He'd already suffered for conscience sake, he reasoned. And thus he decided that he was free to attend Church of England services. Satisfied that he'd settled the matter, Charles got up from his seat, but was immediately struck by a violent change of mind. He would rather be killed than attend. And thus he had to suffer the consequences. As a result of his refusal to attend parish services, he became liable to pay fines to the king of £280, which is approximately £32,000 in today's money. And he was paying this off at £20 a month until King James II's declaration of indulgence cancelled the remaining debt in April 1687. And this was part of the policy of toleration that King James embraced in the summer of 1686, seeking support from dissenters and Catholics. Section 5. Assurance. Charles goes on to recount a significant spiritual experience that happened about 18 months after his baptism, around 1684. He was in his shop about noon, in his usual way, was turning over in his mind his spiritual troubles, when suddenly he was overwhelmed by a desire to pray. He hurried upstairs to his private chamber, closed the door, and immediately began to pray silently but fervently. He knew himself to be in the presence of the infinite, perfect, just and almighty God and was simultaneously struck with the sense of his own sinfulness, imperfections, nothingness and insufficiency. All his past life flashed before him and he knew that nothing he had ever done or could do would count for anything before this great and righteous God. Despite all his own, quote, righteousness and religion, he saw himself as a sinful creature. In this desperate case, but in faith and hope, Doe says, he threw himself away, even before the throne of God, to be lost or damned, but if saved, only because of infinite mercy in and through Jesus Christ. As a drowning man clutches at anything near him, Charles says, so he reached out to Jesus Christ as the only possible means of his salvation. He saw more of Christ than ever I did 
in all my life before. Now he knew that he could not save his soul himself and that if ever it was saved, it must be by the free and precious grace and admirable goodness of God. And so I prayed that he would save me for Jesus Christ, his sake. But even in this moment of spiritual revelation, Charles Doe did not cease to be Charles Doe. He's still engaged in some contorted reasonings with himself about damnation and salvation. But he came to a kind of pause in his prayer, he says, as a prisoner at the bar waiting for the judge to pronounce judgment. And when once, for once in his life, he was actually struck silent. But the pause was a very short one. And Charles was then struck by a sense of astonishing love. As immediately Jesus Christ was revealed to the eyes of my soul to be the Son of God in such a manner as I never before believed him to be and then so manifest to me to be at the right hand of the Father and that God was reconciled in him and my sins pardoned and I pronounced clear or justified by and through the suffering nature love of Jesus Christ as a Saviour. As he ended his prayer, Charles found his understanding and affections changed and was sure of heaven and out of danger of hell. Charles had already explained how he felt he'd been converted years before, though deficient in understanding. But now for the first time, he experienced assurance of salvation. After years of sitting under preaching, which emphasised that salvation came through your own free choice and depended on your own continuing faithfulness to Christ, how amazing it must have been for Charles now to realise that salvation was all of God's free grace. And for Charles Doe, this encounter with God was not just a passing spiritual high. A calmness and joy settled on his heart as the fear of damnation left him and assurance became very real. Now, says Charles, instead of trying to serve God in the hope that he might do enough to be saved, he wanted to serve him out of love and a desire to please him. Typically, Charles spent a lot of time thinking how best he could do this. Should it be through suffering, as many of his brethren were currently experiencing? And into his mind, powerfully, came that text from Revelation 2, verse 17. I will give unto him a white stone and a new name, which no man knows, save him that has it. He'd read the verse before, but now he felt it applied to him directly. Quotes, a child of God, a Christian indeed, a favourite. He thought of that new name he'd been given, which signified that unique inner relationship he had with God and the white stone which represented to him Jesus Christ, a rock, a sure foundation, a chief cornerstone. And Charles is writing this account in June 1688, about four years after this wonderful revelation. And he's able to say that though the intensity of that mountaintop experience had faded a little as time went by, as it must, his assurance of heaven of sins forgiven and reconciliation with God had remained with him. Temptation still came to him, especially about why he'd wasted so much time. But he says, God gave him present strength, especially through reflecting on that experience of God's grace and love that had been afforded to him. But Charles is too aware of his own failures and sins to credit his sense of assurance to his own holiness. He knew that if God should give the best of us no more than we deserve, he must give us nothing at all. Charles then relates some answers to prayer that he's had of his wife's recovery from agonising toothache as he prayed for her. Of the realisation that in having Christ, he had something infinitely above worldly success when he was tempted to envy the great houses 
and prosperous businesses that he saw as he walked along. And sometimes, during the persecution times, instead of going to his normal church across the river, Charles went to hear a more local preacher, Mr Stephen Moore, pastor of a particular Baptist church in Southwark. Charles confesses that he found Mr Moore's uncompromising preaching on election a bit hard to take, and often he felt it, that he wanted to walk out, though he didn't for fear of causing offence. When dissenters started to meet privately in houses, Charles applied to Stephen Moore for temporary admission to communion, while still retaining his membership at Paul's Alley. And he didn't want it to be thought that the people he belonged to were what he called free willers, Arminians, so he gave a statement to Mr Moore, which showed he'd come a long way in his understanding of election, even if not as far as Mr Moore. It read, I cannot believe election in that large sense, as many do affirm it to be, before the foundation of the world. Yet I do believe God hath a people he will certainly save, and nothing shall hinder. And I believe myself elected, but whether I was so before the foundation of the world or no, I cannot say. But this was enough for Stephen Moore, and Charles was admitted to communion. And Charles continued to wrestle with the, elect, uh, the issue of election, but eventually was able to report, at length I believed in eternal personal election. You might think that this would have settled the matter for him, but no, Charles was still tempted to question God's disposing of everything by an eternal decree, predestination as shown by the following story, which I include because it's so characteristic of him and it made me smile. Charles was travelling to another fair in the course of his business, about 35 miles out of London. When cutting through a field, he noticed a kind of bug crawling across his path. Immediately, Charles thought, Did God, do you think, from before the foundation of the world, decree or for a point that this little crawling creature and I should meet in this place at this time, or that I should come from London to meet it thus? It was such a hard question that Charles had to stand still in the field to ponder it. Finally, he concluded that God and his attributes were infinitely beyond him and his understanding, and there were some things that must be accepted just because God's word said so. And what a lot of effort and worry he could have saved himself if he'd realised this before. And another story I include because it seems relevant to a dilemma we're still faced with today as Christians. Charles recalls a time when he was standing outside his shop one evening and he saw a beggar coming along the street. The man didn't appear to be lame or sick which would have been good reasons to offer him help. But his behaviour suggested that he was drunk. In his speech, the beggar often blasphemed. Charles wouldn't give him anything, and the man passed on. But for many weeks after, Charles was troubled about his refusal to give him even a farthing, which he'd begged for in Christ's name. When Christ had mercy on him, Charles, when he begged for forgiveness in Christ's name. Charles concluded that though the beggar may have been a blasphemous drunk, if he or a similar came along again, he would give him something to prevent my trouble of mind. Section six, a new direction. In 1685, Charles heard exciting news. The famous Mr John Bunyan was coming to preach in London at a meeting that Stephen Moore was holding in a private house. Charles had read some of his books, so he decided to go along. At first, Charles, because of his new understanding of New Testament light, as he put it, was offended when Bunyan announced an Old Testament text. But despite his initial reservations, Charles was completely won over as John Bunyan preached. His sermon was, quotes, 
so New Testament-like that he made me admire and weep for joy and give him my affections, Charles said. And the first man that ever I heard preach to my new enlightened understanding and experience. For me thought all his sermons were adapted to my condition, being full of the love of God and the manner of its secret workings upon the soul. But I could weep for joy most part of his sermons. And doubtless many others felt the same when they heard Bunyan preach. But Charles did something which many of those others did not dare to do. He decided to write to Bunyan to make his acquaintance. And no doubt he also conveyed his appreciation for his preaching and writings. And from then on, Charles took every opportunity to listen to Bunyan preach whenever he came to London. And sometimes over 3,000 people would gather, hoping to hear Bunyan, though not all could find a space in the crowded building. And Charles Doe only knew John Bunyan for three years or so before Bunyan's death. Bunyan died in London on the 31st of August, 1688, after preaching his last sermon near Whitechapel on the 19th of August. Charles missed Bunyan sorely, saying, I have not since met with the man I have liked so well. And as well as hearing Bunyan preach, Charles was also reading Bunyan's books. In March 1686, Charles records, I was reading Mr Bunyan's book, Saved by Grace, and I thought, certainly this is the best book that ever was written or I read, except for the Bible. And then I remembered I'd received a great deal of comfort in all of his books. Sometime after this, as Charles was standing at the top of his stairs, he began to think more about how best he could serve God. By the time he was halfway down the stairs, he decided that selling books was the best thing he could do. And when he reached the bottom of the stairs, he concluded that he would sell John Bunyan's books, he being the author he loved the best and from whom he'd received the greatest spiritual profit. And this decision led to what was probably the greatest achievement in Charles's life. He became the first editor of Bunyan's collected works, for which Christians owe him a big debt. When Bunyan's widow Elizabeth died in 1691, the manuscripts of 12 works not printed in Bunyan's lifetime were entrusted to Charles Doe, who paid Bunyan's son for the right to publish. The following year, 1692, Charles published these 12 works along with 10 other titles that had already appeared in print in one volume. These didn't include Bunyan's works of fiction like Pilgrim's Progress, just sermons and tracts and doctrinal works. And this was significant because for the first time, Bunyan's works were brought together and issued in folio format, large size, a format usually reserved for eminent university divines and biblical commentators, not for despised self-educated tinkers accused of non-conformist fanaticism. One Anglican, Edward Fowler, likened Bunyan's writings to the brutish barking of a dog. But even dissenters didn't give Bunyan unqualified approval at first. However, Doe's edition of his works helped to establish Bunyan's reputation as a practical, serious and orthodox theologian, something which was built on in later generations. And even though the volume was not perfect, there were errors in it, it probably saved some of Bunyan's lesser known works falling into oblivion and being lost to future readers. In order to get this volume printed, Charles organised a subscription of 400 patrons. A copy cost 10 shillings unbound, 12 shillings bound, five shillings down, five shillings at the book's delivery. Those who subscribed for six copies would get a seventh free. It included an engraved portrait of Bunyan and a eulogy by two pastors, 
and each copy had a space for the details of the subscriber to be filled in. Doe includes a full index with cross-references, a catalogue of Bunyan's works, um, and a list of 30 reasons why readers should buy the book, Charles was a good salesman, and a concluding piece, The Struggler. As a commercial enterprise, this first Bunyan failure was a, uh, folio was a failure, though this didn't stop people accusing Doe of prof profiteering. But it did succeed in making Bunyan better known and accepted. There were plans for the publication of a second edition, which never came to fruition. But Charles did continue publishing. He published several other works of practical divinity, including his own work on baptism, snappily entitled The Reason Why Not Infant Sprinkling, But Believer's Baptism Ought to Be Approved, 1694. His accounts of miraculous cures, and of course, his collection of experiences of the work of grace. So finally, and seventhly, by way of conclusion, nine lessons from the life of Charles Doe. Charles concludes his narrative by declaring, I, silly I, impotent I, surrounded I, have told in print many of the secret things of my soul. In some quarters, his publication was hailed with mockery and his motives were cynically impugned. At least one person made downright malevolent comments about him. And Charles Doe draws his account to a close at a stage when he was still only in his mid-thirties and there were doubtless many twists and turns still to come in his life. But little is known about his later life. But we do know that in July 1695, Charles applied to join May's Pond particular Baptist congregation in Southwark. Originally, this met in Fleur de Lis Court, a narrow passage off Tooley Street, just around the corner from where Charles lived. This church had been formed the previous year as a breakaway from the particular Baptist church pastored by Benjamin Keach, which met nearby in a large wooden meeting house in Goat Yard, Horsley Down. And this was the famous church, later located in New Park Street, Southwark, to which Charles Haddon Spurgeon was called as pastor in 1854. And the issue over which the Mays Pond contingent split with Keach's church had been Keach's introduction of congregational hymn singing. Some members were unhappy that unbelievers present would be singing words that didn't apply to them. Well, Mays Pond made inquiries about Charles Doe from his previous church in the Barbican and evidently were satisfied with reports they received. And Charles gave his reason for leaving his former church as unhappiness quotes with their new brought in singing. And though not stated, it seems that doctrinally Charles's current position on predestination must also have satisfied the particular Baptists to whom he now joined himself. Sadly, although toleration after 1690 brought material prosperity to many dissenters with it, also came spiritual decline and doctrinal drift. How Charles fared in his later years, we don't know, but we can be sure that his gracious and sovereign God remained the same. In 1688, Charles had confessed that although sometimes he still had, quotes, unaccountable perplexities of mind, thoughts and counterthoughts, he no longer questioned his eternal security, declaring, for I am satisfied that the Lord would not have done these great things for me if he had been minded to have cast me away. And methinks I have nothing to boast of but infirmities and have often had cause to say, as old Jacob did, the angel has preserved me all my life long. When Charles died is uncertain, but it seems likely that an April 1730 will of Charles Doe, comb-maker, 
is that of our subject. If this is indeed our Charles Stowe, he would have been about 78 at the time of his death. The will is very brief, but it indicates that Charles Stowe was probably a widower by this time, with two surviving children and a young granddaughter. And we'll end with the nine lessons that Charles Stowe himself felt that he had learned in seeking to live as a Christian. One, believe no point of doctrine just because this or that good man has said it. You might think this a bit surprising, given Charles' reverence for John Bunyan, but perhaps some people had accused him of idolising Bunyan. And obviously he's very aware of the danger of regarding any human being too highly, however godly and wise they seem. Two, accept no point of doctrine but what is revealed. And following on from the first point, this is a reminder that God's revealed word, the Bible, is to be our only authority for what we believe. Three, take no point of discipline for church government, but what you find precept or example for in the New Testament. Again, Charles emphasises the importance of God's word in matters of church organisation and life. And he makes a distinction between church and state, a fundamental dissenting principle. Four, take no conversation to be good, but what is agreeing with the moral law. And here, Charles is challenging those who argue that under the new covenant, Christians are free to live as they like, because they're no longer under the law, but under grace. And he stresses that the standard we should live by, and which we should assess any behaviour by, is that set out in God's moral law, the Ten Commandments. Five, worship is only good when it pleases God. We might think a particular way of worship is good, but, says Charles, the real question is whether or not it pleases God, and we have his word for it in the New Testament. For God will accept nothing in his worship but what he has appointed. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Six. In your study of the scriptures, the New Testament should have the preeminent place. The New Testament, Charles says, should be like our mistress, Sarah, and the Old Testament, as it were, her handmaid, Hagar. In the New Testament, we have the covenant of grace and the fullness of the person of Jesus Christ, whereas the Old Testament, though of great use, emphasises the subservient covenant of works. 7. In matters of duty and discipline, prefer truth before peace. And Charles stresses that in this point we shouldn't be peevish, peevish self-conceited, whimsical or spiritually proud, arguing every issue in an ungracious way. But if it comes to a choice of peace within a church or truth, then truth is more important. Otherwise, you will only be left with, quotes, a peaceable, untrue religion. A majority of votes, declares Charles, is seldom a friend to the gospel. Eight. It is our duty to fear God and honour the King. The scriptures tell us to do this, and so we must. But, Charles says, we must be sure that we always fear God before we honour any man or human authority. The believers in his time had to choose between their allegiance to God and a monarch who would not allow them to meet freely. Charles had struggled with his conscience on this matter, but had realised that God must come first and persecution must be accepted as a badge of obedience. Let's pray that if we too are faced with such a choice, we will have the strength and courage to always stand firm on the Lord's side. And ninthly, we are eternally secure in Jesus Christ. Charles says, this excellent way of salvation by Jesus Christ 
secures the salvation of a person in the hands of God and Christ, so that there is no danger of him that is to be saved ever miscarrying. God gives the soul to Christ, and Christ says, All that the Father has given me shall come to me, and no man taketh my sheep out of my hand. They are bought with a price, even the precious blood of Christ, who by one offering perfected for ever those that are sanctified, that they might be with him and behold his glory.